Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. David Lowe, adjunct professor at the um, Antarctic Research Centre at Victoria University of Wellington. As many of you will know, David's no stranger to Taranaki, having grown up here, and we are fortunate to be able to share this evening with him. A very warm return welcome, David. David was one of the first people on Earth to find measurable proof that human activities were changing the atmosphere and warming the planet. He is an accomplished academic. He is a well-respected member of the global atmospheric science community and he is here tonight to share his, back, his groundbreaking work and contribution to the global record of climate change. His presentation will focus on climate change, changes science and the huge amount of input that will be required from engineering and science community alike to adapt and mitigate these changes. We will we'll also learn something of how a country kid from Bell Block came to have a career in atmospheric chemistry. Part of this evening will be an opportunity for some interactive exploration of the ideas presented. Please join me in welcoming David here tonight. Well, I can't tell you um, just how great it is to be here. Uh, just a real uh, privilege to be in this very special place, this very special province. It's decades since I lived in Taranaki, <clears throat> but it's in your blood, isn't it? It's, it's a place I've never, ever forgotten, and I've always loved returning here. So, um, I think we should kick off. Yeah, so uh, I've got a list of things here I'm going to talk about. As Gary said, just some very brief stuff on climate change, how the atmosphere works and how it's been changing. But what I really want to do is to get on to what is, what is actually happening, the Paris Accord, which all of you will have heard about, what are the things that are going to be needed to be done to mitigate what's happening, how do we adapt to what's happening, and the absolute essential role of engineers. Um, I can't stress that enough. It's just a privilege to be able to speak to a group like this. And you'll see why that is as I go along. Then there's a very sudden break through into my Taranaki background. And I'm going to share with you something that I have never aired in public before. And we'll just see how we go with that. Uh, I know Gary's a bit nervous about what I'm going to say. But we thought we might have a break there and talk about the science and the engineering before I dive into this totally disparate part of the talk. Then I'm going to finish off talking about young people because I am in contact with a lot of young people. And as you can imagine, um, what some people are calling as an intergenerational crime, that's, that's what they're experiencing. They're very concerned, they're very nervous. So I'd like to talk a little bit of that through with you. At the end you will have to decide whether I'm an optimist or a pessimist. And my last slide is a bunch of questions for you guys. So let's see how we get on. So the first thing I'd like to talk about, two concepts about the atmosphere. And the first one is it's an incredibly thin film. And if you look at the satellite shot of New Zealand, you'll see above there a very thin blue line. And that's the atmosphere. And it's not even the part of the atmosphere we live in. It's actually the mesosphere. It's probably a couple of hundred kilometres up in the atmosphere. The part that we live in, called the troposphere, is incredibly thin. It's only a few kilometres thick. And if you have a look at that exponential relationship there, the pressure drops off very rapidly with height. Once you get to about five kilometres above the surface, the pressure is already down to about half what it is here at ground level. It gets very cold. You've, do you remember the time we flew in jet planes? 
seems a long time ago, you saw an indication of what the outside temperature was, and it's very cold, it's minus 50 typically, and there's very harsh radiation. So all of the life that we know about lives in this thin film. So that's the first concept. So the warming of the atmosphere, if we didn't have an atmosphere at all, the average temperature on the surface would be very, very cold. It would only be about minus 18. But because we have an atmosphere, there is a natural, what we call a natural greenhouse effect, and it's astonishing. It's actually 33 degrees warmer on average. And so the average temperature around the Earth is about plus 15. The greenhouse gases that do that, the principal ones, are CO2, methane and nitrous oxide. But the thing about those gases is they're actually amplifiers. What they do is they amplify the effect of water vapour, which is actually what is the principal greenhouse gas. And um, if you remember the saturated vapour pressure of water, it's actually an exponential function. As you increase the temperature of air, you get exponentially more water that the air can can carry. So, um, you know, if, if you go to a place in the tropics where it might be 35 degrees, if you've got 100% relative humidity, that's incredibly oppressive. And that's because of all of that water vapour in the air preventing you from sweating and, and cooling your body. Okay, here's the next concept. And it would be relatively recently that scientists have developed an area of science which is called Earth System Science. And the idea behind this is that the Earth is actually comprised of four very large reservoirs. Three of them you can see there, the atmosphere, the oceans and the terrestrial biosphere. The other one is simply the planet's rocks or the geosphere. These reservoirs are in close contact with each other, they're interactive and you get natural cycles that have been occurring literally for hundreds of millions of years, cycling things like water, carbon and nitrogen. Net primary productivity, which is what all the plants on Earth accumulate from the sun, is an extraordinary 100 gigatons of carbon per year. Now that, that's a good number to remember as I go on. We're now changing the carbon balance and we're actually doing that by adding the same gas to the atmosphere that's already there, carbon dioxide. We need carbon dioxide. So you sort of wonder what, what's all the fuss about actually adding a little bit extra? Well the thing is this, that extra carbon dioxide was not part of that earth system um, equilibration system. It was locked underground for literally hundreds of millions of years and it wasn't until it was burnt, say burning coal, oil or gas, that it was then ad added to the Earth system. And you can see here um, fossil fuel emissions in 2018 actually added 10.5 gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere in the form of CO2 and that's actually if you express that as CO2, it's around about 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide. So remember, the Earth itself processes 100 gigatons. You can see that already humans are up there with the big players, with the Earth itself, in terms of modifying the way the whole system works. That extra carbon, carbon dioxide, fortunately for us, around about half of it, after it's been emitted from smokestacks and the like, actually gets absorbed in the southern oceans and in the terrestrial biosphere. The other half, the extra CO2, is essentially staying in the atmosphere forever. A carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, in the late 1800s, um, there was a Swedish chemist, a guy called Cervante Arrhenius, 
and he proposed that maybe carbon dioxide um, from the Industrial Revolution could be changing climate. And he came up with some calculations and showed that it was perhaps hundreds of years in the future that there might be an issue. In the 1900s, the first part of the 1900s, last century, there was very little known about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And anyway, people weren't doing research um, into the environment. They were too busy fighting two world wars, um, a whole host of other minor wars. And um, yeah, people really weren't ish interested too much in the environment. And it wasn't until the 1950s that uh, there were serious questions raised. Well, what about carbon dioxide? Well, what's it doing in the atmosphere? No one knew. And so along came this, this man, this is um, Dave Keeling, Professor Dave Keeling, and he made the first measurements of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere towards the end of the 1950s at this site here, which is Moana Loa. It's a volcano on the Hawaiian Islands. Next one. So within two to three years of making measurements, he made two extraordinary discoveries. The first was that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was showing a seasonal cycle. And what he discovered was the remarkable thing. He, he discovered that the planet is, it was breathing. This was the northern hemisphere, and during spring, carbon dioxide is sucked down, and during leaf fall or autumn, it goes up. So a completely natural phenomenon, which has been going on for ever since there were plants on Earth. Completely natural and not an issue. Okay. Yep. So you can see the amplitude of the seasonal cycle there, and you can see the other discovery he made was anything but natural. He established for the first time ever that carbon dioxide is increasing in the atmosphere. So this was the first proof that humans were actually modifying the atmosphere by injecting huge amounts of carbon dioxide. Okay. Now we have a whole time series and uh, what I've put up here is the measurements in black from that mountaintop in Hawaii and you can see the seasonal cycles there. And the measurements that I started here in, in 1970 in New Zealand. And you can see the growth rate is the same. Both hemispheres are increasing dramatically. It's an exponential growth. But you can see here in the southern hemisphere, the measurements that I started, there's no seasonal cycle. So uh, anyone have a guess as to why that might be? Yep, yep. Um, essentially, we live in the ocean hemisphere. So we don't have the terrestrial plants here that you do in the land hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, where the spring has a very uh, pronounced effect on carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Where does that extra CO2 come from? We know that it's naturally there. Is, is there a problem? What, what would the source be? And if you have a look at this, this is the isotopic ratio of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, derived from ice cores in the Antarctic. There are, when when um, snow falls in polar regions, it traps air, and after a while that air becomes ice, and there are tiny little bubbles, and it's as though the Antarctic and the Arctic are like museums for the way the atmosphere used to be. And if you drill down into the ice, and make measurements of those bubbles, you can find out things about the atmosphere going back hundreds of thousands of years. And so you can see here, once the Industrial Revolution started, this isotopic ratio, which it's a carbon isotopic ratio, it's like a fingerprint. It shows the clear signature of CO2 that's come from 
burning fossil fuels. The other thing, piece of evidence is that precise measurements of oxygen in the atmosphere show that oxygen's going down, which you'd have to think is a bit of a worry. <laughs> but it turns out that it will be around about a quarter of a million years if we kept on burning coal and oil that we'd be in real trouble with oxygen in the atmosphere. So that's one bogey man that we don't have to worry about. Okay. The other thing that I began at Bering Head, Bering Head by the way is a New Zealand atmospheric station. It's over the other side of the harbour from Wellington and the thing that's dramatic about it is it's completely exposed to winds uh, from the Antarctic. So you can make measurements, what are called baseline measurements, of gases in the atmosphere and you get an answer which tells you what the whole of that part of the southern hemisphere is doing. So with methane, um, you can see quite a large seasonal cycle here in the southern hemisphere. And that has to do with the way that uh, methane is removed from the atmosphere. It's removed by a chemical process, a free radical, and it will only last in the atmosphere for nine or ten years. And so that, that is a very seasonal effect. This free radical, there's much more of it in the summer, so it, it drags it down. Um, the other odd thing about methane, though, is you can see its growth rate in the atmosphere is all over the place. It's very different to CO2, and it remains a puzzle as to why it's so variable. Next. We also started measuring methane isotopes, and they're just in the case of atmospheric carbon dioxide, they tell you a lot about the origins, their fingerprints, they tell you what is going on with methane. And the interesting thing here is it's dropping down, and this kind of methane, with this signature, is it's actually um, pointing towards biological sources of methane. So what it's saying is that what these data are showing is that over the past 10, 20 years, there's been an increase in the biological um, source of methane. And this, these are things like wetlands, paddies, ruminant animals. And uh, relative, the relative proportion of fossil methane, which might come from leaking gas wells, seems to have reduced. Okay. Um, what I'd like to talk about here is what, what actually happens? Why, why is there an issue with these increasing gases? And the thing about them, if you look at the physics, they do what is called radiative forcing. And that's, that's actually expressed as a power density in watts per square metre. This change, carbon dioxide, that's the error bar there, is since the Industrial Revolution. And you can see all of these things have changed. There's methane, which is in second place, and then these other gases are minor. But also, um, we actually do things which reduce the issue of, of global warming by filling the air full of smoke and aerosols. Um, we've changed the way land works by changing, taking vegetation off it. And the sun itself has changed a tiny bit. But the net human radiative forcing is over 2 watts per square metre. And if you integrate that over the whole of the Earth's surface, the energy is absolutely colossal. And I did a calculation here. Actually, it's sorry, it's on the next slide. So we'll go to the next slide. Due, due to this enhanced effect, having these extra gases in the atmosphere, there's a lot more energy now received from the sun than's going back into space. Most of that is going into the oceans. So it's kind of like this ticking time bomb. Um, enormous amounts of energy stored in the ocean. And of course, there's large hysteresis when you, um, <clears throat> when you change water. The specific heat of water is pretty high, so it doesn't change as rapidly as it does on land. And if you look at this equation here, this is the uh, Boltzmann, Stefan Boltzmann rule. 
and you can see that it's the temperature it's uh, to the power of four and so what happens is as the temperature gradually increases the height in the atmosphere to equilibrate all of that extra energy increases and it's just as well that that law is t to the four imagine if it was only linear you know well none of us would be here basically so we're at the stage now where humans are definitely planet changers and uh, geologists define these eras and the era that we're living in or we're living in was called the Holocene now people are calling it the Anthropocene <clears throat> because the planet is very much in an age where we are controlling what happens to it so here's the Earth's energy imbalance and for about the last 30 to 40 years oceanographic institutes have been dropping robotic uh, floats into the ocean and these these can actually move up and down vertical profiles and via telemetry they send temperature data <clears throat> back to the labs who've who've dropped them and so the what you're seeing here is absolutely extraordinary the ocean heat content has increased dramatically especially now it's really shooting up and this is the calculation that I did um, that energy increase that we have done now it's as though someone was letting off five Hiroshima bombs every second that is that is the energy change in the atmosphere is this working okay with the mic or was it a bit does okay so the global temperature records this one here uh, is from a laboratory in the US and yes they're still allowed to do a bit of climate change research and you can see that essentially when I started making carbon dioxide measurements which was around here there was no temperature increase and so I was the only person in the southern hemisphere making these measurements and it was pretty weird because all of the physics was there you could see that there should have been a temperature increase but there wasn't <clears throat> and so you imagine you're a 20 something year old kid and you go to a party <clears throat> oh g'day Dave what do you do well I measure this funny gas that's in the atmosphere and there's almost none of it there but it's changing the climate you see oh so that's that's terrible so have you seen the change then uh, no <clears throat> so it wasn't until the late 80s or in the 80s that the US and other countries introduced clean air acts that took away all of that air pollution all of those aerosols and there was the greenhouse gas signal hiding underneath and you can see what happened like a coiled spring out it came so some people have suggested hey you know um, to keep the planet cool we just need to stick a sunshade up in the atmosphere you know let, let's fill it full of aerosols and rubbish so what, what's your gut feeling about that anyone want to mess with the planet do an experiment doesn't seem like there are any takers there are a lot of issues with that and not the least of it is that carbon dioxide is changing the acidity of the ocean uh, the pH is changing to the point where it's affecting you've probably heard of coral dieback all sorts of other issues so you put a sunshade up there it might cool the planet but it's going to do nothing for the oceans there's a lot of uh, records like this there are reconstructed temperature records and you use what are called proxies uh, using isotopes and old shells and old cores you can have a stab at what the temperature used to be not as accurate obviously as having a thermometer out there but in the absence of a thermometer it gives you a very good idea for what the earth has been doing and particularly from sediment cores you can see that we're in uncharted territory in at least the last few million years the earth has has not been this warm as far as we know for millions of years so what about other effects well here in New Zealand uh, typically um, right the way through the last few decades uh, we've suffered the tail end 
of tropical cyclones. On average, there's less than one of these things a year. In 2018, there were four. And uh, the, damage, the damage was extraordinary. Um, and I personally observed this, and I'm sure you did as well, in, in living by coastline. Um, my brother-in-law actually lived here, in this place. And when he, when he bought his house by the coast, I did warn him about climate change. And I said, oh, you know, uh, 20, 20 years down the track, you might have an issue with this. Well, little did I know it was going to be much quicker than that. He's sold up. He's gone. Uh, a neighbour of his also sold up and sold it to a young couple. And the lawyer for that young couple said, oh, look, you know, um, there's a real issue with climate change here. You could lose everything. Um, I advise you strongly not to buy this property. And if you do, I'm sorry, I can't act for you. And so their response was, oh, well, stuff you. We'll just get another lawyer. So pretty, pretty foolhardy. And the, the Capity District Council now has an ethos of managed retreat. They're not, they're, they're not going to protect things that are down... Uh, by the coast and insurance companies are becoming increasingly unhappy about insuring properties along the Cavity Coast. So these, these cyclones, this thing, Gito, it really hammered Wellington. And I'm not sure whether this was the one that actually went way down south and, and, and hit uh, Fjordland and went across to Dunedin. So that it was enormous damage, uh, very expensive. Okay. Landslips. Um, there are certainly civil engineers here. You'd know all about these issues. Um, New Zealand is very susceptible to this. Manawatu Gorge, of course, has been closed for a long, long time. They're now going to, if they, if they build that road again, and it looks like they will, it will have to be rooted in a totally different person. They're just going to have to write off all the investment in the existing road. Okay. It used to be that um, in terms of natural disasters, the ones that were most expensive, uh, both in terms of loss of life, as well as in terms of money, financial, were earthquakes. And a typical one was uh, the uh, Fukushima earthquake, the, the one that took out the nuclear power plant in Japan in 2011. That was the most expensive I was going to say natural disaster, but was it natural? Um, 300 billion US dollars. Turns out now that the hurricanes, and in 2017 there were two, each of those, they were 290 billion US dollars each. So you can see now that these climate risks have caught up to the extraordinary risks of, of earthquakes. Um, here's the Christchurch earthquake down here. The hurricanes, um, what's going on there has to do with global warming directly and the ocean water temperature, which has increased dramatically. That's the fuel for a hurricane. So uh, with the latent heat, you wind up with so much more water vapour in the atmosphere and the energy increase is just dramatic. Hurricanes are normally... Uh, defined on a scale from zero to five. They're talking about maybe having to introduce a hurricane level six, a category six hurricane, because these things are now starting to have winds that are sustained winds over 250 kilometres per hour. Okay. Okay. Um, the Paris Climate Agreement. This was in 2015 five years ago, and you imagine my situation, you know, um, for decades I've battled this thing. I've seen, I've seen carbon dioxide and methane increasing in the atmosphere. I've known what's coming. I've talked to politicians. I've talked to policy people. Nothing happens. Here, finally, there was this extraordinary agreement. Most of the countries, most of the world's countries ratified this with pledges. And so the idea was to set the pledges to avoid 
what's called dangerous climate change. And the idea was to keep, try and limit it to one and a half degrees, but certainly keep it below two and reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in a way that it didn't threaten world food uh, production. So this, this was brilliant. I was absolutely elated. Okay. So what happened? Well, for someone like me who watches carbon dioxide and, and methane in the atmosphere, absolutely nothing. Just went on increasing. The emissions kept on increasing. It was basically business as usual, leading inevitably to dangerous climate change. Okay. So here we are in the 2020s, and this is really it. This is the decade that we really, really have to get serious about reducing carbon if we want to avoid dangerous climate change. So we need, in order to do that, you can look at uh, simple projections. We have to halve carbon emissions by 2030, that's only 10 years away, and go to, Z to uh, net zero carbon by 2050. So the cool thing is that New Zealand, in law, has a Zero Carbon Act, and that was signed by all parties. It was a multi-party proposition. There's also an independent New Zealand Climate Change Commission. Two years ago, there was a Productivity Commission report, and that, those, those guys are really good. They do all sorts of stuff on the economy. They've certainly done things on engineering, and they looked at how do we transition to a low emissions economy? And they came up with some brilliant ideas that were not acted on. Okay. How do we stop the warming? This graph is a little bit out of date, but essentially if we want to stay under two degrees, you can figure that we can emit no more than around 2,900 billion tonnes of CO2. 2011, we'd already done two-thirds of that. We've now done around 70 to 80 percent of it. And in actual fact, around about now, um, we'll be locking ourselves into the one and a half degree target. And the reason for that is although that land temperature record showed we we're about one or 1.1, 1 .1, there's all of that heat stored in the ocean. If we shut everything down now, around about half a degree, would come out of the ocean before the whole Earth system was in equilibrium. Okay. Yep. So one and a half degree target, a bit, yeah, sometime next year if we go on at business as usual. All right. So looking at projections, um, here we are at the moment combining carbon dioxide and methane, we're doing the equivalent of around about 50 gigatons a year of, of carbon emissions into the atmosphere. So the countries that ratified the Kyoto Protocol set up a bunch of pledges. New Zealand did, the UK did, the EU as a whole did. And when you looked at those pledges, they would have got us to a target of something like two and a half to 2.8 degrees by the end of the century. But in order to get to net carbon zero by 2050, we've got to be dropping like this. And that's just, that's just not happening. No one's sticking to these pledges. Unfortunately, what's going on is this temperature of 4.1 to 4.8 degrees is unimaginable. Um, this, this would be a totally different planet. It, it's hard to conceive any kind of civilization surviving that. This is just um, something I took from that um, productivity report and it's pathways down to zero carbon. You can see that if you start with early mitigation and drop down, then you can achieve the goal, hopefully without not too much economic pain. 
But if you carry on with your emissions going up and then you think, oh man, you know, this really is dangerous climate change. We don't like this. The economists say that this is not achieve achievable. Basically, societies would break down. You can't suddenly pull all of the carbon out of your economy at, at that kind of rate. COVID-19. What an extraordinary event. What, what an incredible um, few months it's been. Who would have thought that would be here this time last year? That, that the whole world would have changed so dramatically uh, with this pandemic. It does actually mark a turning point for climate change. And the reason for that is that because of the drop in industrial activity and um, particularly things like air travel, international air travel, for the first time in the record, there's quite a dramatic drop in carbon emissions. It's projected that this year, 2020, they will be 7% lower than last year, 2019. And in actual fact, way back to um, where they were in 2010. Great, you think, but it's been horrible, hasn't it? You know, it, it, it's just so much um, that, we're, that people around the world have had to endure. If we want to be serious about getting to net carbon zero by 2050, we're going to have to keep up at that rate year after year until 2050. So it's pretty clear that unless governments intervene, those emissions are going to rebound. And we have seen something like that. You remember the global financial crisis in 2008. Emissions actually went down a wee bit then but they rebounded the following year. Okay. So to me, um, there are some parallels between uh, COVID-19 and climate change. The climate emergency, and a lot of people call it the emergency, I, th I think it really is. It's kind of like COVID-19, but it's in slow motion. And the thing is to tackle both of these existential threats, because that's what they are, both of them. You need complex science, you need resilience, political leadership, and you need public support. And if you look at the countries that haven't done too well with COVID-19, and I won't name a large country in the Northern Hemisphere, um, political leadership seems to be absence and trust in engineers and scientists is not there at all. Um, I think the latest um, public person appointed to deal with the emergency in this large country is a radiologist. Epidemiologists don't, won't cut it. And you need that public support. So what a pain it's been being locked up, horrible, but we did it, New Zealand did it. And we've done brilliantly with COVID-19 as a result. The domestic economy has been able to open up to a large extent, uh, although we're shut off for the rest of the world. So it's the same thing with climate. You need to have decisive state intervention. And to me, what's got to happen is once we start to come out of this pandemic, because we will, human beings are really smart, we'll, we'll, we'll tackle it. We have to have fiscal recovery packages that actually tip the economy towards a totally different way of running energy, transport, agriculture and the rest. We cannot afford to have fiscal packages that support same old, same old. If they do, um, this might sound a bit corny, but I'd say we're we're going from the COVID-19 frying pan into the climate change fire. Sorry about that. But we, we have to change what we're doing. And I'm going to talk about the vital role of engineers in this. So looking at um, the emissions from New Zealand, New Zealand's very different from a lot of other OECD countries. 
and that agriculture forms a huge part of our carbon emissions. And a lot of that is um, methane from ruminant animals. You can see that in terms of energy, uh, the major one there is transport. And in terms of New Zealand's carbon emissions, which are still increasing, at uh, the Paris Accord we were going to drop them, but New Zealand's emissions are increasing. A lot of it has to do with transport, and in particular the light vehicle fleet. It's not the heavy vehicle fleet so much. You can see that uh, we have a situation where there's quite a large forest sink in New Zealand. Now there's some remarkable research. You think naturally, yeah, okay, that's Pinus radiata. But there's some incredible research just come out this month out of Niwa showing that fjord land is a large and increasing sink for carbon dioxide. And you think, how could that be? You know, that's native forest. Um, what are the changes there? But the research is robust and it, it's a major milestone. So it's showing that our native forests, you don't need to think all, always about Pinus radiata, our native forests could be a major sink. Okay. Yeah, so um, this government was going to um, plant a billion trees over the next 10 years. Well, I used to go to Bell Block School, and you can do a simple piece of arithmetic that shows you to do that, you've got to plant 200 trees every minute day and night. So that's, that's a tough call. Uh, it just strikes me that maybe the um, primary school kids from Bell Block ought to bowl down to the beehive and have a bit of a chat with them. Uh, ruminant methane emissions. What a tough one that is. The thing about those methane emissions, they're caused by bacteria called methanogens that work in the rumen. They don't need to be there. They, they don't do anything useful. In fact, the contrary, they actually take energy away from the animal, from both the meat or, or say, the wool in the case of sheep. So there's a lot of work going on now looking at whether you can work on getting rid of those bacteria, a change in fodder, for example. And it's, it's looking quite successful. Do we have to move away from livestock farming altogether? Uh, the Earth's population is projected to go up to 10 billion people. Can we afford to keep um, beef cattle and dairy cattle running around? Are we, do we need to look for other protein sources? These are huge questions. Electric vehicles. Very interesting thing. If you look at the um, overall electricity production in New Zealand, at the moment, it's around 50 terawatt hours a year. You can do a simple back of the envelope calculation show that you could run a fleet of 2 million electric vehicles on less than 10% of that. You wouldn't have to build any new power plants even. There's certainly a matter of distribution. But a lot of the rhetoric that comes out about electric vehicles is, oh, it's going to take all the electricity away. Well, that's not the case. And the case is very simple. The reason why, it's the second law of thermodynamics. If you look at uh, an ICE car, by the way, to those of us who drive electric cars, an ICE car is an internal combustion engine. Less than 25% of the energy that's in the petrol or the diesel goes into forward motion. Whereas in the case of the chemical um, energy in a battery, well over 90% of it does. So to move an electric vehicle, you only need 160 watt hours of energy per kilometre. That's tiny uh, compared to an, a car with an internal combustion engine. And of course the big thing here, most of our electricity production is renewable. It's around 85%. So if New Zealand wanted to reduce its emissions, the quickest way would be to start converting that light vehicle fleet. Avoid the import of all new petrol and diesel vehicles, or if people really want to import something like that, then you put a, a fee bait on it. And I'll talk about that later on. Okay. 
What about aviation? Um, incredible, you know, you think we're, we've all flown. What will happen? Um, because aviation was one of the, it was the fastest part of transport emissions internationally. So there's been suggestions on um, powering jets, and, and Air New Zealand's tried this, using biofuel, mixes of ethanol. The issue with that is you need to use arable land, and if you're making ethanol from corn, um, one of the comparisons I've heard is that um, to fill the tank of an SUV with biofuel made from corn, that would be enough food to feed a family for a year. So biofuels, I don't think, are a future on a crowded planet where you have 10 billion people to feed. If you look at batteries, the very best lithium-ion battery at the moment, its energy density is only about 2% of jet fuel. So flying aircraft with lithium-ion batteries just at this stage too heavy for long haul, maybe for short haul. Hydrogen powered aircraft, um, fuel cell, or there's uh, a research group in Germany who are working on making kerosene, aviation gas, from a mix of hydrogen and CO2. The point about that CO2 is they've, they're taking it directly from the atmosphere, so you're looking at a renewable process. So that, that, if that can be developed to a commercial scale, that could be a real game changer. Okay. Electricity generation is an interesting one because most of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been produced by coal-fired power plants, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. But if you look at this graph in the OECD, the proportion of coal has dropped dramatically and is now actually exceeded by renewables. And you can see natural gas is going up. And the interesting thing about the United States at the moment is uh, despite their present administration, the emissions, carbon emissions, are actually going down in the US. And the reason is because of fracking. They're producing so much natural gas that ut utilities uh, with coal-fired power plants are converting them to natural gas. And of course, natural gas is a far more efficient way of producing energy than burning coal is. So their emissions are going down for a while. OK, so I've put this slide up uh, for you guys. Engineers are incredibly innovative. Um, there's a group in Auckland that I've worked with um, at what's called the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. And they're looking at some really cool stuff. And one of them is, if you look at uh, photosynthesis, a leaf, it's actually a very inefficient process. It relies on electron transfer that's driven by light. <clears throat> it's less than 1% efficient. So what about designing an artificial leaf which captures more sunlight and turns more sunlight into sugars, which is what plants do. They make, they, ultimately, they make sugars. This fits in with the next idea I had there, which is better photovoltaics. And a German colleague of mine in Heidelberg, University of Heidelberg, the Institute for Environmental Physics, he's come up with an idea where you use photovoltaics to produce hydrogen by uh, electrolysis, and then you combine that with carbon dioxide to make sugars. And he's shown that in actual fact, a sugar beet farmer, which is the classic thing in Germany, you'd see sugar beet uh, farms everywhere, they're actually better off just putting in photovoltaics and making sugar using this process than the centuries old process of having to dig up sugar beets and boil them up in a big factory. Energy storage, huge advances. Um, if you look at um, internal combustion engine, you imagine there's at least a century's worth of development gone into that. Now there's huge development going into a different battery technology, and so the advances are incredible. And uh, one of the latest is 
that instead of using a, a cobalt substrate for the cathode, they're now looking at an iron substrate, which is much, much cheaper to produce and um, certainly a lot more friendly than using cobalt. Also, lithium itself, um, it's actually a very common element in the Earth's crust. It's, it's more abundant than lead, for example. And um, Elon Musk in Nevada, he's now mining clay deposits to get the lithium out of it in a, what he refers to as a sustainable way. And if you look at, look at it and read the reports, it looks like that. And they will be, Tesla will be making these lithium ion batteries using an iron substrate. I talked about electricity to gas and sugar. Artificial meat and proteins, autonomous vehicle technology, all, all of these things, engineers are working on them. Removing CO2 from the atmosphere is the big one. How do we do that? If you can figure out how to do it, there's your cost. We're damaging the atmosphere by putting CO2 into it. How much does it cost to pull it out? I mean, I think intuitively you, you'd have to say hundreds of dollars a ton. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave it here because now we come to the abrupt change to the Taranaki kid. And I don't know whether you want to drive this, Gary, just if there's any, okay, a few okay. questions. So, um, we, if we can take questions on the material covered this, this far. There was a very interesting article um, by Gwyn Dyer was in a week or so ago, around recording a speech by President Xi of China. The United Nations about China's uh, intentions. And those guys have no intention of stopping CO2 um, uh, emissions until um, 2030, um, because the Chinese Communist Party won't survive if they do. And they're not going to stabilise until after 2060. And Gwyn said that it basically means we're heading for four degrees no matter what the rest of the world does. So yeah, I mean, that's. Yeah, I was going to talk to you about that later on. Um, that's a pretty grim projection, but the intriguing thing now is the satellite... Oh, you can't hear, sorry. The incredible thing now is w with the advance of satellite technology, you can actually measure plumes of CO2. And this is very similar to the work I talked to you about, about NIWA. China, China's emissions are actually going down. They're going down now. Yeah, well, the satellite data say they're going down. So I was actually going to talk to you. Um, this, this was a question later on. And it, young people really face this. How do we get information that we can rely on? How do we know? And, and in, in the 21st century, with, with all those bots, the alternative facts, a kind of a post-truth society, the manipulation of data, you, re you know, it's, it's really dangerous territory, and we see that going on in the US, of course, with a president who can't tell the truth, the difference between the truth of reality and, and lies. So you've got a situation where the measurements say one thing and the communist leader says another. I yeah, but he's also flogging by, uh, uh, coal fired um, power plants around the world. So they must be, and all burning coal, so he must be putting it up, even not in China, but everywhere else he sells coal-fired power plants too. Yep, I, I can't corroborate that, but what I do know is that the fastest growing renewable energy generation is in China, and that's both wind and solar. It's just quite extraordinary. I can see someone nodding up there. So the, these are things that we have to evaluate, and I'm not discounting what you're saying, but I'm saying we have to be so careful about what is actually happening and what is not. And I'm, you can see, my whole life I've made measurements. I trust those measurements because those measurements come back to the basic principles of physics. Those satellite measurements show that China's emissions are going down, the EU's emissions are going down, UK's emissions are going down, New Zealand's are going up at the moment. Sorry, anything. Yeah, um, you were talking about um, animals and 
methane emissions and what have you. And sure, we've got more cows and whatever that we used to have and what have you. But if, you, if in Africa, for instance, they used to have huge, America, huge herds of, of roaming animals that have been decimated. Somewhere along there, there must be some sort of equilibrium achieved. Yeah, so um, I'm not an expert in the numbers of bison. Is that, were they ruminants? Maybe they were. I don't even know they were, <laughs> whether they were ruminants. Um, but it seems to me that what we have now is absolutely colossal. Um, is that what they are, is it? Okay, so they're ru definitely ruminants. So when you look at the extraordinary um, feedlots in the US, industrial farming, and, and in the EU, um, the number, you know, the ruminants are extraordinary, the, the masses of them. And certainly people have done measurements estimating the methane emissions from them. And uh, it's not as bad as wetlands, say, uh, rice production, but it's right up there. Rice paddies produce a lot of methane. Another question? One of the things that I've often wondered about is the um, altitude at which CO2 is emitted. If you think about jet aircraft for the last, uh, say, 60 years, we've been flying around at 30,000 feet plus, and obviously a lot thinner atmosphere, uh, and emitting quite a lot of increasing amounts, actually, every year of CO2. Yep. Now, with higher and higher high-speed aircraft, uh, does that have, and I asked Boeing the question, and no research had ever been done which worried me because I thought they should know the answer, um, what happens at higher altitudes in terms of atmospheric effect of the release of CO2? Yep. No, that's a, a very good question, and contrary to what Boeing said, um, there's actually been studies for decades using balloon-borne equipment, looking at the, the altitude profiles of gases like CO2, methane, and other, other trace gases. The atmosphere is actually amazingly well mixed right up through the stratosphere. It's not really until you get to the mesosphere that you really start to separate out gases. And that's because the density of the atmosphere is it's so thin there that you get long travel paths for molecules. And for example, a molecule like hydrogen can literally escape into space. It's not an issue for CO2. But the interesting thing about jet aircraft uh, in the stratosphere is they produce ice crystals. Those ice crystals, um, as well as the ice crystals, the temperature of the exhaust is high enough that they produce nitric oxide, NO. Um, we were talking at the start of the, start of the meeting, there's actually no reaction between nitrogen and oxygen normally, but there is if you get up to 2,000 Kelvin. So you make nitric oxide, that's on those ice crystals. If those ice crystals find their way to the polar regions, like the Antarctic, you get ozone depletion, catalytic ozone depletion. So the CO2 is not, not really a major player, it's, it's the minor amounts of NO that are released by the aircraft. That's the issue. And of course, ozone depletion um, results in atmospheric heating. It, it, do, it does. It's linked in. Um, I'd thought about talking about that tonight, but I figured there's enough bogeymen out there already. <laughs> <coughs> Shall we take one more question before moving, yep. moving on? I've, I've seen some recent information that's Wondering whether meth methane is fully accounted for in its greenhouse gas, uh, in the numbers that people are putting out in carbon emissions and that sort of thing. Are you? Do you have a sense of whether uh, methane has actually been accounted for in the current CO2 calculations um, and the temperature effects of that? Um, yeah, I mean that's a no that's a brilliant question. It was kind of left out of the Paris Accord. And you, you saw in the radiative forcing diagram I gave, it's actually a major player. So the simple answer to your question is unfortunately no. And there's a, a group here in New Zealand 
who are working very hard on that. Um, they've published a couple of recent papers and it's, you know, it's not good news. Thank you. Okay. One more question. <coughs> okay. Devil's advocate here. Uh, as John said, with, with countries like China, India, producing so much stuff, I mean, China's burning something like 10 million tonnes of coal a day. Um, they're just producing so much. Why does it matter in Dinky, little old New Zealand whether, yep. whether we make any change? Because we can have no effect on the world at all. That's um, it's a great question. And um, there was a debate in New Zealand between a couple of political leaders, both of them women, and one of them said, New Zealand's contribution to carbon emissions is 0.17%. Why should we bother? So it's exactly the same question. And I'd like to propose that we leave it till the end of the session to talk about that, because that that question really isn't a science one so much as one of ethics, um, what, you feel, what young people feel, what economists think. Um, if you start normalising things and saying, yeah, hey, wait a minute, um, the per capita emissions of a New Zealander are 20 tonnes of carbon dioxide per year compared to someone in China where they're less than five, so it's, it's a very complicated question, and I'm just a simple scientist. But I'd, I'd love to hear views maybe at the end of it. I'd, I'd, I'd like to know. Let's the, do the that. Real, the simple answer to why you want to get rid of oil is it's not going to last forever, so the city is going to change away from the better. I mean, it just makes sense to do it. Whether you're sort of saving the planet or not, it just makes sense because it's not going to last forever anyway, so therefore it must go to it and let it be done with it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, um, we're going to move on to Taranaki now. And um, this is actually a little bit difficult for me because um, it's something I've never shared in public before, but I've decided I'm going to do it. I mean, if I was ever going to do it, this is the place to do it. So um, the reason Gary got on to me for, the, for this talk was, I believe, because of this article which was printed in virtually every newspaper in New Zealand uh, towards the end of last year. It's actually a, a young reporter, a guy called Joel McManus, an investigative reporter, and he, he wrote it brilliantly. The result was that I was absolutely inundated with emails, text messages, phone calls from all over New Zealand and Australia. So he, he touched a nerve. He, he touched something and you think, what, what did he do? Now, yeah, it's about climate change, a very serious situation, but he also, it's also about a Kiwi. Um, that's what I am. I'm, I'm a Taranaki boy. Working away for literally decades, making measurements which are validated, they obey basic physical principles, and we know that they're damaging the atmosphere. And so that's, that's what he did in that article. And it, and it really, really captured people's imagination and just the way he wrote it. So I've, started, I've written a book that kind of follows that outline. First of all, I had to learn to write. I'm just a scientist. I, <laughs> I didn't know how to write books. And so that's been accepted by a publisher. At the same time, I was contacted by a documentary filmmaker, uh, a guy called Costa Botes, who actually did a documentary film on The Lord of the Rings for Peter Jackson. And he's not very far away, that's him over there. And he's been following me and he's, sometimes he's a pain in the ass actually. <laughs> but, but he's okay. So uh, let's have the next one. So here we go, um, Taranaki. I grew up on what was called the old New Plymouth Airport. I don't know whether there's anyone here who even knows what that is. Someone's nodding. Great. Yep. Lots of people. My father was a radar engineer and he worked on uh, distance measuring equipment for 
aircraft flying around New Zealand from a station that was on what was then called Mount Egmont, Mount Taranaki. And my parents lived in a tiny little flat, a two-room flat. We had a, um, an outdoor bathroom. There used to be ice on the windows in the winter. And there was a transit camp full of people who were in poverty. There were displaced people and they were put up, I think by the, well, who knows what it was. It wouldn't have been in the New Plymouth City Council back then, but they lived there and there were lots of kids. And so I grew up in this environment which was, by today's standards, incredibly poor in poverty, uh, but a fantastic place for a kid. I went to this school, Bell Block School, uh, that's the old airport, um, the right-hand picture. And I had an amazing time in the 1950s. I don't know why it was, but for some reason I was incredibly young at Bell Block School. I'd barely turned 12 when I went to New Plymouth Boys High School. I was the smallest of 1,100 boys and I was beaten up from day one. It was a dreadful experience and um, it resulted in me learning absolutely nothing. I barely scraped through school certificate, which is what we had back in those days. And at the age of 15, I could legally leave school, which I did. And so I went to work in the New Plymouth Telephone Exchange. And do you know where that New Plymouth Telephone Exchange was? <laughs> well, that's, it was right here. And, uh, and you worked here. No, just a local. Just a local, yeah. So um, my job at the exchange was cleaning the grease off, off these electromechanical telephone exchange parts and making cups of tea for the senior technicians. And it was brilliant. For the first time I was with adults. I read comics every day. And I met the first people who surfed the Taranaki coast. And I discovered the environment. I mean, this is an amazing place. Absolutely. You know that. You live here. It's incredible. And so suddenly I saw what the ocean was like, what waves were like, what the atmosphere was like. Okay. And so... Um, I started surfing. <coughs> that, um, that is a homemade surfboard. We, uh, I mean, you couldn't buy surfboards, so it's made out of a, a lump of polystyrene with boat fiberglass. And yeah, we used, to, we used to surf around the coast here, and I got a real feeling for all sorts of things about the environment, which also included local pollution. Um, there used to often be uh, raw sewage in the sea off the coast here. That was a terrible discovery for a young uh, teenager. There were uh, rubbish fires everywhere. The bush was still being burnt. Um, I don't know whether any of you remember, but people used to throw fish and chip papers out of their car windows. It was just, it was just sort of a mess, and it, it started to offend me. Anyway, I'm not sure how it happened, but. Um, a primary school teacher took an interest in me, an unassuming man, his name was Ray Jackson. Maybe some of you met him, I don't know. He was here in New Plymouth for a long, long time. And he asked nothing, but he used to, he used to just talk to me about what I was seeing out in the waves. And he said, you know, um, books are really interesting. And I said, books? Because I was just reading comics. He said, yeah, the, you know those books on waves and surfing? You should go to the New Plymouth Library. So I did, and I was utterly amazed to find all of these books on surfing, ocean waves, engineering. It completely opened my mind. And so what was I to do? I decided that I really wanted to study the atmosphere. I wanted to study physics, but for a kid here, in New Plymouth back then, I mean, that was a crazy idea. You might do accounting or um, agricultural science, but atmospheric physics, good grief, that's just crazy stuff. Anyway, I, did, I, was a, 
I was a dropout, I didn't even have university entrance, and so after some discussion it was decided the best thing I could do was to actually go back to that same school, New Plymouth Boys High School. And so I did. And I went back there and one of the issues was military drill. And I went back as a new boy. I didn't enrol in the military drill battalion. So every time they had military drill, I'd be off surfing. It was a brilliant experience back at that school. They had a whole bunch of new teachers. I think there must have been something like a teacher shortage in New Zealand. And they had these young 20 year old uh, teachers from Scotland. It's a bit difficult to understand their accents, <laughs> but they taught physics, maths, and I was just totally into it. It blew me away, and I just, yeah, just absolutely went for it. And that one year I got right up to speed, I wrote a letter to Victoria University and said, hey, is it okay if I come in early? I, I don't want to stay another year at the school. And so I went down, had the interview, and it worked out. Okay. So with the physics honours degree that I did at Victoria, I also did quite a bit of electrical engineering. So I just have this feeling for engineering. It's always been with me. When I graduated physics honours, I went out to the, the DSIR, and serendipity is a funny thing. There was that guy, Dave Keeling, who made those very first measurements. He had a team of three Americans in New Zealand and they were looking for someone to give them a hand to make the first ever measurements in the Southern Hemisphere because it was realised that a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere was disappearing. Where was it going? Maybe it was going into the Southern Oceans. The only way to find out was to make measurements in a place like New Zealand. There I was, the kid from Taranaki, suddenly thrown into this extraordinary job. There was a big fight uh, between the American scientist running the project and Dave Keeling back in California. So that American scientist disappeared, leaving two technicians, American technicians, one who was a very keen hunter, the other one was a very keen f fisherman. They were being paid these wonderful American salaries, so they just buggered off and left me with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment trying to run this whole Southern Hemisphere CO2 thing on my own. Man, what a, an experience. Talk about being thrown in the deep end. So I did that and I worked on that through until, for, for about nine years. Okay? And I realised that to get any further I had to understand atmospheric chemistry. The best atmospheric chemists in the world at that time were all in Germany. And so <clears throat> I applied and I already had the experience uh, making the CO2 measurements. I'd published papers. I had this physics background and they offered me a, schol a scholarship to do a, a PhD, a doctorate at uh, University of Cologne. Okay. And uh, four years later or so, I came out with the PhD and there was two of us, my wife there, we went to Germany alone and we came back with the PhD and two children born in Germany. So it was a pretty fruitful sort of a time, really. So that, that experience just changed my career completely. It just opened up all sorts of possibilities. So I had the engineering, the physics background, but I also had atmospheric chemistry, which meant that I could really, I can really move on and I spent a lot of time working in the US and uh, building up a group, an atmos a top atmospheric chemistry group here in New Zealand. And this is the group uh, that I uh, built in Niwa. And this was a real buzz. This guy here, that's Paul Crutzen, who um, was one of the people who won a Nobel Prize for discovery of what was causing depletion of the ozone layer. So he, he came to visit us which was pretty neat. Um, I developed a lot of techniques. I've mentioned isotopes. Isotopic techniques are really important in atmospheric chemistry because they allow you to tell a lot about processes. Like, like process engineering, you need techniques to figure out what's going on, and isotopes help you do that. Okay. Um, 
In 2005, out of the blue, I got a, I got a call from the United Nations in Geneva um, asking me whether I'd be interested in working for them on a report, a, a so-called IPCC report, which is the state of the atmosphere, all, all of the research about the atmosphere. Uh, ask me whether I'd, I'd be a lead author for that and that there might be a little bit of work involved. Well, I had no idea how much, <laughs> it just, just about broke me uh, the three years. But we came out with a report in 2007 and out of the blue that report was actually awarded uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. So you see this little finger here, Gary? That's a Nobel Laureate because there were about 300 of us on that report. So in 2007, I turned 60 and I knew that I wanted to talk to groups like this. I wanted to get out outreach on climate change. I could see what was coming. NIWA, the way they were funded, they couldn't really support that. They were a great organisation to work for. So I left a really great job wonderful people into the unknown of being self-employed and that for me that's that's been brilliant it's worked out really well I've worked for people like Gareth Morgan <laughs> who's a bit of a character I think you all, all would have heard of him he wanted uh, to produce a book on climate change for New Zealanders so I helped him with that I also worked for MB wound up being six years as the New Zealand Germany science and innovation coordinator so that had me going all over New Zealand and Germany looking for places of excellence where you could combine techniques and technology in both countries. And that was a real buzz, that worked out really well. And the Bioengineering Institute that I talked about in Auckland, I managed to um, land a graduate school which was worth millions of euros and into the uh, University of Auckland. So, that felt really good, you know, helping young people. This is young people. These are the people that New Zealand needs, highly trained, passionate individuals. So, um, the book and film projects, I've talked about that. Am I an optimist or a pessimist? Are we sleepwalking towards disaster? So we'll go to the next one. Can you imagine what it's like for young people? And I've talked to a lot of them now. They're not all boy racers. Um, some of them think they're highly intelligent, they care, they're incredibly well read, and they are really pissed off at what's going on. Are we to blame? Did we do this? So the role of informed teachers is incredibly important, and a lot of the teachers I've met at high schools and also at primary schools, they're brilliant. They're really onto the onto this situation. If we're going to move towards a net carbon zero world, the role of engineers and scientists is going to be incredibly important. Okay. What about politics? Anyone here talk to politicians? It's it's just incredible. It's it's kind of like walking through treacle. So we know that carbon, carbon emissions damage the atmosphere, but there's no price on carbon, really. We've got an ETS, an emissions trading scheme, but since that came in in 2008, emissions have just continued to go up. It hasn't done anything, and agricultural emissions are not in it anyway. The Feebate scheme for low emissions vehicles, I touched on this um, about 15 minutes ago. So the idea here is you use a price signal to encourage people to buy low emissions vehicles and this would be for example putting a fee on new petrol and diesel burning vehicles coming into New Zealand that fee fee bait you transfer that to people who are buying low emissions vehicles whatever they might be that was on the government's radar and then it suddenly disappeared due to the actions of a minor party what about the rights of the individual versus the many? You know, in a way that touches on what you were talking about with, with China. You, um, 
And you see what's going on with COVID-19 and demonstrations against wearing masks. Does a society have a right to say, hey, look, you know, um, uh, you damage the atmosphere if you put CO2 into it. And so if you want to put CO2 in, into the atmosphere, then, um, yeah, you're going to have to pay for that. Does a society have the right to do that? And how do we feel about that? These, these are huge questions. And here's the question I talked about. You know, New Zealand, uh, a political leader in New Zealand a couple of weeks ago said, yeah, 0.17%. Why, why do we have to do anything? We should do nothing. And then politics itself. I'm not a politician. I just really have difficulty getting to grips with it. But the political terms are so short. You look at Gary, he's been in his career for decades. You know, you learn how to do stuff. As a politician, you're in, in New Zealand, you're in there for three years, and a lot of the time you think, oh man, I might be voted out of office in a couple of years, I better, I better not do anything to rock the boat. So you don't. And that word tax or that word fee, our constituents, are we all to blame? We think, oh yeah, we, you know, we, we're not paying high taxes, we, we're not going to pay um, for putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And there is, I don't know whether those same political um, signs are around here, but certainly in Lower Hutt, there's one that says, what is it? No carbon tax. Not that there is a carbon tax at the moment. Okay. So we're back at the beginning. This is where I began with the thin film. And for someone like me who's watched the atmosphere for a long, long time, Increasing carbon emissions is not a valid option for life on what is a finite planet. I have the next one. So this is where I'm going to finish off, and I've just put up a whole bunch of questions here, and we'll just see how we go. Okay. So thanks very much. Really appreciate it. So would you see us able to export hydrogen? Fantastic. And what, what do you know about actually uh, the processes where you could convert hydrogen using carbon in whatever form into things like aviation fuel? Is that feasible? Or? Well, it happens at the moment, right? So methanex takes gas, takes yep. hydrogen, takes the carbon dioxide, and basically makes methanol. So okay. Great. So, to, you know, to me, uh, oil and gas engineers are incredibly important. It's those very skills that are desperately needed to take us through this transition 
into hydrogen if, the, if, uh, if that's what it becomes. And you can see the, the opportunities there, like is it, is it Carpuni, I forget where it is, where there's a company building a fleet of hydrogen powered trucks. And I think that that's hydrogen driving fuel cells with electric motors. Do you know about that? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's incredible. And the other cool thing is I know that MB is putting quite a lot of money into hydrogen research for Taranaki. So I'm hoping that's coming your way. Me too. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot for that. Appreciate it. Just uh, last year we had two um, monthly meetings uh, with a focus on the hydrogen industry in Taranaki. And the first one was the uh, MPDC Hydrogen Future Vision and that was presented by a senior MPDC planner. And we had Haringa Energy, who are the ones that are making the hydrogen down at Carpuni, and they came and talked to us about the practicalities of making and distributing hydrogen. They were two of the best attended meetings we had last year, with about 50 to 60 people at each. Good meeting tonight. And um, we have had arranged this year a presentation by the National New Energy Development Centre um, who have recently been, um, I don't know whether it's taken over, rebranded, rechristened, whatever, Ara Ake, and the leader of, uh, the, the chief executive of the National New Energy Development Centre was going to come and speak to us. She no longer is in that role and the new uh, director isn't familiar enough to speak, so we've we pushed that out to next year. Um, but there's a reasonable chance we might be able to do a public presentation in the same way as we've done this one tonight. So that might be of interest to you. Some of the brief for that was talking about the sort of things that Dave mentioned with um, super high um, voltaic cells and what have you. So there's some really interesting technology. Any further questions? I'll, oh, um, I'll ask Rob. Yeah. Uh, okay. um, so, just on behalf of uh, Engineering New Zealand, Taranaki branch, I'd really like to thank David for coming along and making this presentation this evening. Um, I found it uh, really, really interesting, sort of um, look, looking at uh, the full range of uh, climate science there, um, getting a bit of an understanding of some of the basics, and also just uh, the insights that you shared into your own young life and what, what led you to your career. And uh, I guess it highlights how there can be certain people in your life that make yep. a really, really huge difference. Yep. Uh, so that was, uh, it's been a really great outcome for yourself and uh, many other people as a result of uh, the, uh, the research that you've done. And uh, great to also see that you are uh, continuing to uh, uh, spend a lot of time in this area and uh, share your learnings. So I'd like everyone to just join me again, and thank you, David, for the Thank you very much. Just been an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much.